now I'm the cat pee guy. Like I'll go out to <laughs> dinner and someone will be like, oh, it's the cat pee guy. Like no one knows my name. I'm just the cat pee guy. I'm not even handsome. I can smell it now. I don't know why you put that in everyone's <laughs> and now, head. And now I'm just going to forget your name and call you cat pee guy. Welcome back to The Walkthrough, where we walk you through this week's trending topics in real estate. I am your co-host, your moderator, and captain of BAM, not a big deal, Dan O'Neill. And I have been absolutely <laughs> left in the dust. If you have been a fan of the show from day one, you know that normally I, I would either be joined by Darth Byron Lazine, uh, Mr. Eric Simon, but... Byron is busy on the phone with Jerome Powell, and Eric is touring Bangkok, uh, maybe Koh Samui, the Philippines. I don't know where he is. Thailand on his honeymoon. So here we are, good old Danny Deals, working his fingers to the bone to steer the BAM ship. But with that, I have assembled a panel of absolute rock stars who will help me make sure the show does not go down in flames. Joining me today by popular demand, Mr. Hot Take, Mr. Brad Pitt. An absolute fan favorite. People are chanting this guy's name in the comments, dripping from head to toe in Peter Millar with over <laughs> 1 billion in sales. Yes, that's with a B. Mr. Andrew Undum from Baltimore, Maryland. Andrew, how are you today? I need you today. Hey, I'm here. Don't worry about Byron and Eric, wherever he's in, in Bangkok and whatnot. We got this totally covered, and I'm just so excited to be on here with Taya's Two Cents, mm -hmm. um, you know, and the whole <laughs> cast here. But look, I'm already overworked and underpaid, so I, this is just another one of these unpaid consulting gigs. Let's get this show on the road. You're telling me. Speaking of uh, Taya's two cents, we are also joined by another fan favorite, the GOAT, the Queen, fresh Aww. off an $11 million listing. How you doing? Hey. Yes, Taya DiCarlo. Taya, how the heck are you? Thank you for joining us. We need every cent you have today. Oh, my gosh. Ooh. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm a... Uh, I'm you know, fresh off of eight hours of sleep. So watch out now. I'm actually mm -hmm. completely recharged and ready for this Hell recording. Yeah. It's about it's about eight hours more than I got last night. And lastly, we are joined by soon to be fan favorite, Mr. 3D, flipping hundreds of homes a year, master's degree from NYU. How are you? One of my best friends on the planet. We just listed the largest 3D printed home in America. Mr. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mr. Charles Weinrob, aka the handsome home buyer. How are you, buddy? I'm doing good, man. I'm fired up. It's a big week. We got a lot going on. We're uh, we're saving the country of Turkey. We're listing the world's uh, largest 3D printed house. We're locking up deals together like crazy and, and listing. It's a good week. We're, we're doing a lot. We are doing a lot, and I appreciate you coming on here on short notice. You are going to be a fan favorite for sure. Today, classic, we are talking about what's working on social. Seven mistakes agents are making right now. There's probably about 100 of them. 3D printed homes, Taya's $11 million listing, how <laughs> handsome Andrew is, and I'm sure a whole lot more. But before we do, a word from our sponsors. Usually, this is where I would ask Eric to take out his Invisalign and do our ad read, but I guess, I guess I'll do it today. The Walkthrough Podcast is presented by Keeping Current Matters, your go-to source for the insights and content you need to be the market expert. KCM is the best at in the business at taking the latest housing data and curating it into powerful visuals and marketing content for video and social media that help you look great and give you tons of value to your clients and prospects. At a time when the market's changing and consumers are asking questions most agents don't know how to answer, KCM makes it easy to build your brand as the market expert. Check out try KCM backslash BAM so you can master the market and your marketing today. Wow. Now I totally understand why Eric butchers that every single week. That is a, that is a mouthful. That is. I thought that was great. I thought you killed it. Eric kills it too. Eric, yeah, Eric does kill it. That, that was a mouthful. That was a lot. Moving on. Please, if you uh, enjoy us, if you are happy that we are here, if you respect the fact that we're doing this with Darth Byron and Eric both gone, please throw us a like, throw us a comment. Tell us how good Andrew looks, how handsome Charles is, and congratulate Taya on a $11 million listing. <laughs> All right, article number one. I'm so sick of hearing my own voice. Article number one is uh, from BAM here. Social media, uh, three experts weigh in on what's working. This is Mr. Byron Lazine, Jason Pantana, and Tom Ferry. They recently did a podcast and a summarization of the show. Uh, the link will be in the notes. But what you need to know, the most important strategic advice for agents on social, 
For agents who want more sales, more listings, more referrals, they need to be strategic when creating content on social in 2023. Here are some of the best advice that was given on the podcast. Number one, avoid the contagion of trying to become a celebrity agent or moving from ecosystem to the ego system. Mm -hmm. Mm, That's powerful. That's powerful. Number two, produce content in your local market that no one has started doing yet, aka hyper local green screen videos, what's happening in your market, restaurants, so on and so forth. Number three, whether you get a listing from a particular video matters less than if potential clients recognize you and the value of your content when you walk through the door. Uh, Don't use politics. We know that. Make a short list of your most effective content and double down on it and create value Create videos that add value to anyone who chooses to follow or subscribe to your content. And finally, let go of the question of, is this going to go viral? Super important. Taya, as a queen of social celebrity here, what are you focusing on right now on social media and what's working for you? Um, Well, I'm... I'm just focusing on what's tried and true for me. And that's being the knowledge broker and providing content that's valuable to the consumer. And I think what really gets lost um, in social media land, whether you're on TikTok or Instagram or Facebook is this, this contagion of the ego, right? People are obsessed with virality. I think it's human nature to want, you get excited when something goes off really well. We, we love this, right? But at the end of the day, so many agents are losing sight of why they're on social media and who their audience is. When you come from the place of who's my audience, it's the buyer and the seller, the investor, you're not going to make content about like stuff that only realtors are going to like, like put, and when you started talking about all that, I thought about this. Okay. For all the realtors listening, imagine you're a professional landscape designer. Are you going to start making content for other landscape designers? No. You're going to make content for someone who wants to build their own garden or someone who wants to learn about seasonality, when you should plant certain things. You're going to provide information and knowledge to the consumer, not to your colleagues, not to your competition, not to you know other landscape designers from around the country. So people need to start thinking about who is my audience and make content for them. Stop making content for other real estate agents. Yeah, I love that. My my father's a landscape designer, and, and that's a really good point because I mean I'm I'm a victim or I'm guilty of it. I, I make content for other agents. It, it is a way to grow your following and brand. But you're one zillion percent correct in the fact that we should be making content for for our consumers, for our clients. Andrew, as somebody that's trying to build their brand, I mean you are going to skyrocket about any day now, especially with that Thursday bread bread pit looking <laughs> hair that you got there. The the volume. <laughs> The volume that you have on that haircut right there. What are you focusing on right now? And you're going to explode. It's only a matter of time. So what are you focusing on right now? Well, we're focusing on a lot. I first have to comment on only people with $11 million listings and and people who who have listed the largest 3D home in the country say things like landscape designer. Here in Baltimore, we just call them (laughs) landscapers. So that's a pro tip. Properly naming things is important. But Taya mentioned something important, making this content for the consumer because- you know, I mentioned Alan Dalton a lot because he's had such an impact on how I think, and he's kind of my mentor and we co-authored a book, but he taught me that the only way you have access to people is through their concerns, which is why you have to talk to the consumer. And you know what? Every consumer in your local town, if you're thinking about the town you live in or the neighborhood, you're thinking about creating some hyper-local content in, you know what every person has in common? Every homeowner has one thing in common, wildly different political beliefs and all different types of beliefs, very diverse. doesn't matter how diverse the situation is. They all want their property value to go up. So that's the key kind of paradigm to look at these things is knowing I can only, people are only going to engage with me if I'm, if I'm putting out content that's, that's addressing something they're concerned about, the value of their home, what's going on in the community, because they all want that property value to go up. So I'm, I'm taking a hard look at that and how we create that content. Um, and I kind of just copy what Taya does. Taya's two cents. <laughs> I mean, she's kind of uh, famous. She, oh, stop it. She is famous. And <laughs> it's, actually a good, it's a good idea. Literally just copy everything. Imagine you just did a what, what's the uh, the the bungalow? What, what's that? The Blanco uh, bungalow. Yeah, imagine you just make the the Blanco bungalow in uh in in Baltimore, Maryland. They probably don't have bungalows there. If you have 
only <laughs> landscapers and not landscape designers. You probably need a landscape designer before we can find a white bungalow we're talking about. But <laughs> a million dollar bungalow. A million Baltimore. dollar famous <laughs> bungalow. Um, Charles, uh, you've been like, if there's a playbook for social media, you uh, you you had to have written it because you've been doing this for years. Like you in, in our hyper local market, you were the first one with the podcast. You were the first one that was posting on TikTok. You were the first one that was posting 10 times a day. If there's a playbook, you wrote it. What are you doing right now, fast forward two or three years, that is working? And what are you trying to stay consistent with? Yeah, so my big thing was with social media, I was always looking to, I didn't necessarily want a very broad market. I wanted a super niche, hyper local, like who would, I don't need millions of followers. I need the people that are going to be driving business to me, which is real estate agents and wholesalers in the area. So how do I like use social media, interact with them? To Taya's point perfectly, you're coming up with things that they care about, right? That are important to them, that are going to make them laugh, that are going to make them engage. But most importantly, I think people forget that social media is really about what we're doing right here, which is collaboration. Come up with all kinds of unique and different ways to put other people in a great light. Like, for example, I do a show called The Elite Agent, where I call up real estate agents like Taya that are doing amazing. And I say, hey, listen, I would love to showcase one of your listings, what you're doing. And this way you can tell other agents why you are so fantastic and tell people that are looking to buy or sell why you're so fantastic. These types of things build bonds and relationships yeah. with people that just drive business. And the more you do it and the more people you interact with, ultimately, the more business that you do. Um, I don't think agents or anybody really has an excuse now. It is easier than ever to create content at scale. All the platforms are favoring short form video. So you can, you know, you don't have a big budget. You don't have a lot of time. You can reuse the same videos over and over and over again on every platform and have them be wildly impactful. Uh, YouTube shorts are blowing up for me right now. Like, I don't even understand it. I'll put something on Instagram, it'll get three views. I'll put it on YouTube shorts. It'll get a million views. <laughs> I don't know what's going on over there. Obviously they're pushing that platform, but YouTube shorts is something I'd really, really uh, concentrate on if I was creating content right now. Yeah. And, and for, for context too, Charles is, you know, flips homes, right? So majority of his content is, is, is advertising to agents, right? For himself. And a majority of his business comes from agents in our market that want to work with him because of his content and because of social media. Like how many referrals have you gotten in the last two weeks? I don't know, a hundred uh. just from agents in our marketplace that want to do business with him because of the content that he puts out there. So phone rings every day, DMs every day. And then I've had agents literally come to me with private off-market deals saying, hey, listen, you're gonna get this deal that no one else is gonna see. In return, I wanna be on your podcast. I wanna shoot content with you. I wanna be seen you know, with you creating. I, I want the ride, I want the action, I, I want it. So it really does work. Can, can you tell Andrew and Taya and all the listeners uh, the name of your podcast, please? No, it's actually now the Handsome Homebuyer Podcast. It's now PG rated. <laughs> it was formerly uh, smells like cat pee with handsome because because every house I buy smells like cat pee for some strange reason. I don't cat know. piss. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. That's so specific. Cat it's pee smells specific. like money. Now I'm the cat pee guy. Like I'll go out to <laughs> dinner and someone will be like, oh, it's the cat pee guy. Like no one knows my name. I'm just the cat pee guy. I'm not even handsome. I can smell it now. I don't know why you put that in everyone's <laughs> and now, head. And now I'm just going to forget your name and call you cat pee guy. There you go. So That's what happens. For that. Charles cat piss. Well, you know, one of the things in that article too, Danny was like, it said long form, form versus short form. Mm -hmm. And if I could only do one, as much as everyone says, and Charles just pointed out, short form's blowing up and that's what the algorithm's like and we, we get that. But if I could only do one, I would do long form because mm -hmm. I have a, a podcast where I just interview just people that I think are important that, that we can learn from. And no, I've never been on it. If you do, well, hey, there's <laughs> going to be a time. I like to do them in person though. Okay. I like to do them in person because the vibe's just better. Yeah, yeah. But when you do a good long form piece, you can chop it up and create that into 20 mm -hmm. short form pieces. Yeah. So I wouldn't just say, hey, long form's no good. Yeah, long form's great, but then it's how content creation is one thing. If content's king, distribution is the queen and she wears the pants because you can distribute this content in any number of ways. And I got to say for Charles real quick, the reason you're being so successful on this thing outside of just being probably overqualified for the job, master's NYU and whatnot, is you're so likable. Because there was a study done, Gallup poll study. They said, hey, which of these four things, this is for sales in general, uh, do you think are the most important? That your salesperson is honest, trustworthy, likable, or confident? Most people say trust. Well, they got to trust them. But it's wrong. It's likable. If you're not likable, you never get the conversation started in the first place. So you have to be entertaining, educational, frequently putting it out there. But you have to be likable. It's like, hey, if you're going on a date with somebody and you're talking to your friend, 
and they say, hey, I really trust this guy, <laughs> but I'm not sure if I like him versus, hey, I don't know if I trust this guy yet, but I really but like, I him. like him. <laughs> if you like him, you're going on another date. This is true. That's that's, that's the clip true. right there. That is uh, that's why I love you, Andrew. That is that is the hot take. That is incredible. It's, it's not so even true. a hot take. It's just uh, facts. No, I mean, well, was, yes. I mean, listen. I'm sure we all know people who are terrible at their job, but you'll still work with them just because you like them. So, yep. perfect point. It's true. All right. Any any final thoughts there? Today? Final thoughts. You gotta be likable. You gotta be likable. Yep. You got to be like, I mean, that's why people are literally chanting uh, Andrew's name in the comments because you are just so likable. Did you have that study? Just like, do you have that written on your forehand or something? Like, I heard that. I heard that at a Berkshire Hathaway event in Omaha from Vince Lisi. Shout out to Vince Lisi, who actually owns, he's got the biggest, largest single office Mm. of any brokerage anywhere in the country. It's like, I think it's something crazy. It's like 70,000 square feet. He's got like 3,000 agents going into one office. It's crazy, right? And it's just an incredible. He was on um, Entrepreneur Magazine about culture and stuff. But he told me that, and I thought that was really good. Interesting. Incredible. All right. Well, if you are interested in taking your marketing game from rookie to rock star, look no further than Jason Pantana's Marketing Pro. We are true believers that marketing can make or break your brand or business, maybe your band too. Becoming a marketing pro by purchasing one or all three of his modules, Cracking the Social Code, Google Business Boss, and Inbox Hero. Our listener, our listeners will also get a 10% discount by using code BAMPRO at checkout. Visit www.tomferry.com backslash MBP to learn more. That's another ad read. I'm done with the ad reads. Throw us, throw us a like. You're doing a great, Dan. Please, this is hey, our- talk about likable. Who doesn't like this guy, Pantana? When he talks, he just doesn't miss a beat. Every syllable is perfect. I think it's a first take, too. I, I think it's a first take. I do. I think he's a one-take yeah. guy. I, I really do. I'm a, I'm a 1,000 take guy, as you can tell. I'm, I am. Uh, anyway, on to topic number two. Please throw us a like, throw us a comment. If you, if you like us, please, for the love of God, let Eric know that he's, uh, <laughs> that he's missing out here. All right, topic number two. Topic number two. Will 3D printed homes solve the inventory problem? This is right up our alley here. Uh, and Charles, actually, you wrote this with the BAM staff. How 3D printed construction will change the market. Imagine a world where your client selects the building lot of their choice using virtual reality they move through their newly designed beautiful concrete house open concept curved walls radiant heat solar tesla charging station gray water system they even select their furniture in each room cost you could save up to 40 percent on forms footings foundation uh, excavation walls and roofing compared to the traditional construction design if you could dream it you could print it Speed, since you don't have to coordinate multiple trades like a plumber and uh, electrician, everything, construction is much faster and quality. Concrete is fire, flood, and insect proof and lasts longer than traditional houses. With supply chain issues rising, material costs, and a shortage of skilled labor, there is an inventory shortage of nearly 4 million single-family homes across the U.S. Is 3D printing the future? Charles... We just listed it yesterday. I have, I don't know, 100 DMs right now. Phones are ringing off the hook. People want to take a look at it. This thing is everywhere. It's on the news. Is 3D printing homes the future? You're on mute. Thanks, man. Sorry. I teed that up so well for you, too. That is... uh, (laughs) Aren't they going to edit edit that little... are, Are 3D printed homes the future? Automated construction, yeah, specifically 3D printed homes is absolutely the future. And it just, it has to be the future. A, construction is is a trade that hasn't, there's been no major disruptors in the last 200 years. And now this is it. So, I mean, I, outside of 3D printed homes, I stop building houses. Everybody knows I build anywhere from 70 to 110 houses a year. I can't physically build a house on Long Island and make money. I'd have to get the land virtually for free. And obviously anybody that lives in New York knows nothing is for free. Right. So 3D printed homes allows builders to make a profit margin. It allows for sustainable housing. It allows for houses that, you know, will last. I mean, your typical house has to be redone every 20 or 30 years. These houses are virtually indestructible for landlords. I'm a landlord. I have over 100 plus rental properties. This is the greatest thing. I'm super excited. We're doing a 25 lot subdivision, all 3D printed. 
you can't you can't break them. The floors are concrete, the walls are concrete, but they still have a very cool, chic kind of um, industrial modern feel. Uh, I'm really excited to see what the public thinks this week when we uh, unleash this thing. Yeah, I mean, yesterday was the first time that I saw the finished product. This thing is like a fortress. It is like a bomb shelter. Nine thousand psi concrete, like. It really, I, what, why are you, you're laughing? No, get to me. Like it, a, a bad... This feels like the Jetsons. I mean, it yes. just feels like completely bizarre. I'm having like a blonde moment where I'm trying to wrap my head around 3D printed homes. Like, I feel like I need to see this in person to really. Did, did you see, it. did you see the design? Did you see on, on I my did. Own? What, I what did. did you think of it? I thought it was amazing, but I still like the, the whole concept of it is so, uh, you know, above my head that it's, it's hard for me to to really wrap my head around and believe that this is the future. And I'm sure our viewers are probably thinking the same thing. Like, how does this actually work? It, it is, it is insane. I, I saw it. I, I mean, and Charles again has his master's degree from NYU. I uh, went to coastal Carolina for nine years. <laughs> when I saw it the first time it looked like a giant um, icing machine, right? You know, like when you go get your happy birthday cake, they squeeze, you know, icing or on your, on your cake. It looked like that. And just a square one, like they just kept going around in a square there were like three guys there, like throwing a football around. Nobody was like working. It was just, it was literally just a machine, like pouring concrete. It was one of the most surreal experiences I've ever seen. Andrew, did you see any of the 3D, any of the videos, the design? What do you think about this? I watch everything you post, Danny. So of course I saw it. And that was a great analogy with the icing, the icing squeeze. Um, <laughs> So the 3D printed homes, like panelized construction has been around for a long time. There's a big company in Baltimore called Blueprint Robotics, and they build it in these controlled environments and robots are involved. But this is different. And like, you know, it's just the same way a jet printer just prints things. This robot just comes in and fills in all the, all the elements. I think it's fascinating. And when I, I'm really bullish on it too, I'm going to agree with Charles here. I do think it's the future. Just obviously you have the efficiencies on it. It's only going to get better. And you can kind of circumvent some of the challenges with the local municipalities and zoning and uh, permits when it becomes so simple and you remove some of the human elements out of this and just say, look, this is the machine. This is going to take care of it all. And everyone co-signs. I think you can speed through the, build, the, the development process just to get ready to build a lot quicker too. So it's not just faster construction. I think the whole, the speed of the creation of the inventory, which we do need, will greatly increase. But here, here's when I really got in on it. So I'm friends with Lennar. You know, I came from the new home world. My buddy's now the president of Lennar here in Maryland. We just listed a bunch of stuff for him. Now, Lennar, one of the biggest home builders in the country, I think they're in the top three, maybe DR Holton or Pulte might be number one, but Lennar's big. They're building 110 3D printed homes outside wow. of Austin. So I'm looking into that. I'm sure Charles has more to say about this. And I thought that was fascinating, but you know who the developer of that land is? The guy, Elon Musk. Oh, really? Elon Musk was behind it with the Boring Company, and they're going to be building these 110 homes for the workers for the Boring Company now. So when you yep. get guys like Elon, now he's got the robots building the cars, and he's developing the land, and you're partnering with these big national builders, and they're going to put up these 100 homes like this, and we can talk about all you know the, the, the wonderful nature of monolithic poured concrete versus block foundation and all that stuff. Stats and facts are for chips, dips, and dorks. That's not for today. You're just talking about creating the inventory. So I think it's going to solve the problem, and we have some of the smartest people on the planet behind it. And Charles, kudos to you for, for just running with this thing because you easily could have been the typical construction guy that says, nope, this is how I've always done it, and I'm making millions of dollars doing it this way, and I like to stick build. But it's not the, it's not the strongest of species it's that survive, right? It's the most, those that are the most willing to innovate and evolve. Adapt. And yeah. innovate and evolve is right. So I like it. Charles, what can you last, last words here on the topic? What is the major selling point? Like if, if you're a consumer right now, why is 3d printing aside from the cost, aside from the efficiency, aside from the speed, why else? Why, why would you buy this home here at 42 Dean? So well, promotion there. It's my listing. No big deal. <laughs> I mean, typically say you can get, you know, you can get good, you can get fast, you can get cheap. I'll give you two out of three. With 3D mm -hmm. printed houses, you really get all of it, right? It's, they're fireproof, they're floodproof, they're built like bomb shelters, they're fast, <laughs> they're 40% less expensive, uh, the insurance is less expensive on them, they're safe. I mean, there's really, there's nothing but, but upside mm -hmm. on them. 
Hell yeah. I want a guy, if we're going to talk about 3D printing homes anytime in the future, I'd prefer it to be a guy with that nice, thick Long Island accent. I like the way you talk about it. <laughs> Not thick enough, huh? My, my, my coffee talk isn't as pronounced as, uh, as others on Long Island. I love no, it. No, it's thick. <laughs> No, it's it is, it, and it's it, much it, better it's than Baltimore. As, uh, as as Andrew's hair right there, the uh, the volume <laughs> on uh, on Andrew's hair. What is it? The Brad Brad Pitt Thursdays? Yeah, Thursdays. we go for the dirty Brad Pitt look dirty on Brad Thursday. Pitt. But that was off air, Dan. Thanks for bringing it up for the public. <laughs> My pleasure. All right. If, if you haven't checked out the 3D printed home yet, uh, it's on our Instagram. It is online, 42 Dean Street. Let us know what you think of the design. Let you know. Let us know if you think it's the future. If it's not the future, if you hate it, if you love it, throw us a like, throw us a bone, anything, please, for the love of God. Topic number three, Inman. Reasons, seven reasons agents are failing and how to avoid their mistakes. This list should be way more than seven, but we'll keep it there. Number one, they're afraid of the phone. We see this all the time. I can speak to that personally. Uh, number two, they thought it was going to be easy. That is self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. Number three, they lack discipline with their schedule. I think that should be number one. Um, number four, they do not prospect enough. Number five, they don't go on appointments. Number six, they feel entitled. Uh, I know all about that. Numbers, I don't even know where I'm at. They think they can do it part-time. It's hard to do. Uh, number 10, I guess they are too passive and number 40, they are looking for an easy button. There's no such thing as an easy button. You got to make a calls. You got to prospect. It's very, very tough to do this part-time. Can't be entitled. You got to work on your skills. You got to have discipline in your schedule and it ain't easy. No. Nope. And seven, I mean, I just rattled off 30, but what do you see with your team most commonly mistakes that agents are making. I see all of those that we just listed. I think the, the discipline and schedule is one of the biggest things because a lot of agents just think that they kind of, we don't have a boss, right? Nobody's telling you to go to the office. No one's telling you your hours. No one's saying, Hey, you got to be here nine to five. Nobody's giving you an SOP, right? Like we're 1099. What are some of the biggest mistakes that you're seeing? Are you kicking that to me? Yep. Well, like I said in the past, I know this was a hit, but you know, in this business as a 1099 independent contractor, you're what I call, you have to be an outdoor cat, not an indoor cat, not someone who's getting the paycheck. Someone's going to bring me a little bowl and I'm going to eat this over here and get the clawed. <laughs> you got to go out there and hunt and kill, which is why I always take this opportunity to bash Redfin because they're a bunch of indoor cats on a 60K <laughs> salary. And I just pray to God I get to negotiate against a Redfin agent for my client's benefits. There will be blood and guts everywhere. I so, love that analogy. It's just so good. guys. So, so good. And we can all agree we're outdoor cats. At least the good ones are. But it comes down to clarity. Okay. Clarity is a superpower. You got to get really clear on who you are, what you want, and what price you're willing to pay. And all these seven things, there was that list. And that's a shout out. Jimmy Burgess wrote that article. He's like the king of Inman. He's my homie down at Beach Properties of Florida. Phenomenal guy. Um, you got to get him on the show, by the way. We'll, we'll, we'll make sure that happens. We'll talk. The, but the big thing for me personally is because I'm a big sales guy. When I got into the business, I had all this new construction sales background and they kind of like lock you in these rooms out in Reston, Virginia, near the CIA. And it was all about sales. Like you wear a shirt and tie and this is how you sell this new construction. And they're real serious about that. Mm -hmm. And then on my days off, because you work every weekend, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, I ended up working at a sales consulting firm and learning B2B sales and these more complex uh, sales situations. Um, and I don't think most people realize what a real salesperson is. Because that's what your license says. You're a real estate salesperson, which it, it has a stigma on it. Like, y'all use car, this or that, slimy. It's not. It's the highest paid profession on the planet. And your really job is to just get people what they want in, in a manner in which they're going to say nice things about you on the internet. So you have to be able to get to the truth really quickly. People aren't confident. Because if you were really confident in front of a buyer and a seller, you would do the things. You wouldn't be afraid of the phone. You wouldn't be afraid of going on appointments. You wouldn't be afraid to structure your day to go out there and hunt like an outdoor cat like you're supposed to be. It all stems from them not having clarity on what their job is. You got to get clarity on what your job is. It's to be a salesperson, which isn't this greasy, slimy thing. It's to help people get what they want, get to the truth, and navigate the process. You get paid for advice and perspective. Yep. So that, that's, that's the missing piece. There's, our industry is riddled with a lack of true sales training. And the only reason I know is because I kind of went through it. Thank God I did. But we get like the coaches and this and that. And it's all about, hey, short do videos, do this, do that. And there's a million things you can do. You know what it's not? Hey, these are the addendums. 
these are the contracts. This is join the board, how to work your lockbox. That's called being a realtor. It has nothing to do with sales. You need both. Yeah. I but, think people are also riddled with laziness. Yeah. I think that, and I, you know, I bet some people will comment and start bashing certain generations for being entitled or lazy or whatever. But I think that's a human, ask, that's a human thing that people want the diet pill. They want to take the magic pill that's just going to get them on the road to success, to get them there bigger, better, faster, stronger. When the truth of the matter is anything that's worth anything like worthwhile is going to take some blood, sweat and tears, whether when, when you actually start exercising in the gym and you build this beautiful physique, you didn't get it overnight. You built it slowly, 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 all of it, uh, you know, you know, over time you were stacking those pennies and the same thing goes for a successful salesperson. I can't tell you how many people I've met who get their real estate license and they're like, oh yeah, I see how much money she's making or how much money he's making. How hard could it be? I was once that same person when I started as an assistant. I was like, okay, I've seen behind the wizard's curtain. This can't be too hard. No, yep. it takes discipline. It takes showing up every day, hearing no, and instead of getting discouraged, moving that perspective into no equals next opportunity and moving on to the next one and not losing enthusiasm with your momentum. Um, because so many people give up because yep. they hear no um, and they just, they feel like they're a failure when in reality, it's just a, a numbers game. Taya, and, and before I pass this to Charles, because Charles is um, dating somebody on my team. Charles is very in with my business and kind of sees my struggles <laughs> and my agent struggles. What? That wasn't like a chirp. That was, I'm being dead serious. Yeah. He sees it firsthand. So I, I'm going to save him for last. But, but Taya, you publicly just like went through something, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, you had some struggles or whatever. And now like you are just absolutely crushing it. I mean, you just put out an 11 or are putting I'm about out about to 11, yes you an 11.2 million dollar home mm -hmm. you are on absolute fire did you change did anything like did you just kind of like were you reinvigorated remotivated did you mm -hmm. have more time more freedom like like what happened the last like six months where yeah like, you're always incredibly successful but you are on another level right now thank you um well you know we're all given the same amount of hours in a day Mm -hmm. Right. So it's how you choose to work those hours that's going to make the difference. Um, having, you know, still going through a divorce right now and being last year taking some private time to just heal myself and come from a more healthy self-love sort of perspective. Um, there's no such thing as balance in life. I believe that you have harmony. Right. So just because the lead singer is singing, in, you know, full force doesn't mean the background singers aren't singing anymore. You have to harmonize. And I feel like last year I took some time off, not time off, but more yeah. time to focus on myself and going into the fourth quarter. It's the first time in four years that I didn't have any pending or coming soon sales. Wow. And I was like, oh, shit. It's time that I put my head down blinders on because I know that what I do today is going to get me paid 90 days from now. So I just started grinding, grinding, grinding. And I knew, you know what? I trust that it's going to work out because if I do the thing, it's going to work. But I have to do the thing consistently, even when I'm not getting results. Yeah. And within the first month of the year, first two months of the year, I now have, you know, 17 million in either closed or coming soon listings, not even buyers. Um, and that's almost, you know, like I, my goal for this year is 88 million. And I have no doubt in my mind that I'm going to make it. And that's all me. That's not. You're, you're going to be in, you're going to be in Greece the entire fourth quarter. Oh, absolutely. And I'll be in Mykonos just like. You know, my, my <laughs> one, I have one more question for you before we pass it to yeah. Charles. So for the agents that, I mean, I'm actually asking this for myself. I'm not even going to yeah. say for the agents at home. For the people that, you know, $500 million range, right? Mm -hmm. How did you, ha like, how did you have that confidence to go? I mean, you you sell in, in the, you know, two or three, four yeah. or $5 million range, right? But I feel like the $11 million range is kind of a different ballpark, right? It is. I mean, I, you know, don't get me wrong. The money's still green with yeah. any deal. I still sell $500,000, $600,000 homes. And I still go on big appointments. I think the difference now, and I learned this from going on that $11 million listing appointment, um, we were up against you know, four other top brokers in the area. But what I observed for the first time in my career, which I've been doing this for over a decade, was that that little voice in my head 
that imposter syndrome that used to say, oh my God, this is such a big deal. I can't believe you're here. That voice was gone. And when I left that appointment, I'm like, the bitch in the back of my head is gone. She's like, she's fucking, she took a back seat. And it was this big epiphany where I'm like, oh my God, she finally shut the fuck up. Because she used to chirp in the back of my head going, I don't know, Taya, like the seller, you know, probably could use a, a, a bigger, better luxury agent. Like, do you even know what you're doing? And that voice just never served me. And so it's been a long road. But there's a difference between mindset and actually doing the thing and having the power, right? Yeah. If you know your market, you're studying, you're doing the old school things that you know work, knowing your numbers, knowing what's going on, knowing what the sellers want and providing that service, providing that value. I got to tell you, behind those closed doors of the $11 million listing, they want the same thing that the million dollar listing people want. They want to get it sold fast for the highest price and for the least amount of effort. They want you to do that for them. So it's really all the same. There's there's not like this big difference in the luxury market. And, and you know why you got that listing, Taya? Like Andrew said, because they liked you. Who yeah, wouldn't? Like, and oh, and they trusted you. you. All you. right, Charles, you, you see this daily. I mean, we, we talk 100 times a day. You see it with the agents on my team. You see it with agents in our market across the country. What do you see as the biggest obstacles? Like what, what gets in, in these agents way? I think it's a combination of things. I think agents, I think being a real estate agent is 20% sales and 80% marketing. I put out a video a couple of weeks ago where it's like agents, real estate agents are not salespeople, although yes, they are, but they're really marketers. That's Disagree. It. Keep going. Oh. <laughs> Your mar <laughs> they're marketers. They have to market to have people want to list their home or work with them to possibly buy a house. So that, in my opinion, is the overwhelming majority of what they're doing. Obviously, there's a lot of laziness in there. What I I'm going to defend the agents and say that, and listen, I know your team, you do an amazing job. You do a better job than any other team leader or broker that I know of on Long Island. I'm not saying that because I love you saying that because it's fact, right? But I think a lot of agents struggle and this is loan officers or real estate agents where they get up every single day and they want to work. Let's say they, they have the desire to work, but they don't know what to do. There is no roadmap. There is no plan. There's nobody that's setting you out there saying, hey, listen, you should be time blocking. You should be doing this and you should be doing that. They don't teach you this stuff in college. I've been to four of them. I know they don't teach you this stuff in high school. How do you know? How do you go out and seek out this type of knowledge and mentors that can train you how, on how to do this stuff? You expect your broker to. And sadly, 99.9% .9 of brokers aren't. So it's it, it's tough. It's tough on agents unless you have that innate outdoor cat ability and you're a grinder and a hustler, which is why it seems like 5% of all the agents or less make all the money. Well, call me harsh, but I think there's no excuse to not be an outdoor cat. If I can Google it like that, yeah. honestly, that is one of my pet peeves about agents who claim that they're not successful and they don't know why. Honey, you know why. You know why. You need to Google it. I'm not kidding you. It's it's infuriating to me that people will ask questions that they could easily Google and get the answer to. Now, if you Google it and you still can't find it and it's like sipping through a fire hose and there's too many things to choose from, that's one thing. But I can't tell you how many people will not be the type of mindset, which either you have it or you don't, that you could just be an outdoor cat and teach yourself how to fish. We live in a time where the answers are out there and they're free and they're readily available. If you're not teaching yourself or searching for that knowledge of how to sharpen your sword, that's on you. You have, yeah. it's it's free, so. I'm with you, I'm, I'm, I'm with ultimate responsibility also. But I'm sure a lot of people, myself included, I don't know if you ever had the situation where sometimes, you know, there's so much stuff that you have to do that you just, you get overwhelmed with how big the wall is that you want to build that you forget. It's just brick by brick mm -hmm. by brick. Um, you know, I always tell our team too, like I can accept failure, but I cannot accept not trying. And Taya just pointed out something. There's a perfect word for it. It's called being an autodidact, which just means you teach yourself. <laughs> <laughs> polysyllabic <laughs> words. Dan loves the polysyllabic words. I can, I can confuse them pretty easily with this. <laughs> no, <but laughs> autodidact. You have to be that in the outdoor. Autodidact. What that? What is that from? Tenth grade chemistry class. What the hell is that? A molecule. Jeez. Uh, it would probably be English. No. That's just a word. But the 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 key th thought process here too is people are, are so avoidance of of they avoid confrontation. 
And that's all this business is. You're going to be confronted with buyers, with sellers, with the agent on the other side of the deal, the appraiser, the inspector, the title company. And your job is to solve conflict and actually agency is representing your buyers like they're yourself. If you can't solve conflict and you're afraid of that, like an indoor cat, well, you're a statistic as you should be. Or better yet, you're going to come get clawed up by people like Charles and Tay are just going to run you over. Yeah. And they're going to look great. And you're going to go back to saying, oh, shit. Most people have never <laughs> went through anything. And it's obvious. Some people have never been beat up before. It's painful. <laughs> I, uh, it builds I, character. <laughs> yeah, I got an older brother, dude. This is nothing. I'm I not actually, afraid to get hit in the face. I actually do want to jump in and support something you said before, which is the art of sales is is lost. And I think there's not a lot of people that, that really have that training. I was fortunate. I was trained. I owned the Mako Body Shop franchise before this. And I was trained by a gentleman who sold Electrolux vacuum cleaners door to door in the 70s yeah. and was trained under like the Zig Ziglar and Tommy Hopkins. And it's about building value, closing, beating out objections, overcoming objections to solve problems and reclosing again and doing this over and over and over again. And that, to your point, isn't, isn't really taught anymore. That's why I said I disagree, because if the marketing's great, but you suck, it doesn't matter. You'll just keep sucking. Yeah. Whereas I'd rather take, give me 10 leads if I can close three of them. It's a lot better than give me a 2,000 leads because my marketing's good, but I still mess them up. But it's the chicken versus the egg. I'm, it's just yeah. podcast jargon. You have to have both. If you yeah, don't yeah, have both, you're screwed. It, you have to have a, a balance of both, right? You have to be a good marketer in, the, in this business to market yourself, to market your brand. But you also have to be able to be a good salesperson and sell the house, sell the story, right? Like sell, sell the experience. So I think it's a 50-50 balance of both. I wish I had, I wish I uh, graduated college and I had as, as uh, big of a vocabulary as you, Andrew, and I don't, but. Um, you're, you're pretty good. You're like a Susquehannaian. You'll get there. You're very loquacious. <laughs> So, what the, what the he's, just, he's just flexing on you now, Dan. Yeah, he's just yeah. flexing on you. Hey, Dan. Polysyllabic. Polysyllabic. <laughs> there was one thing that we got from Elite Retreat when Phil Jones sp uh, spoke on the last day um, mm. for anybody listening that was there. And he was teaching everybody about how to be a better salesperson, right? And one of the things he mentioned was even if you don't know the answer, like no one wants to be pitched, they want to be helped. They want to be served. So when you come from this place of curiosity and understanding the context, you don't have to be the best salesperson. You just need to be human and make it not about you, make it about the other person. So when you go on that listing appointment and you're up against some big dogs in your market, if you go in there and you slow it down and you let the consumer or the, the client do the talking, you're going to be able to serve their needs instead of just steamrolling them and making it all about you. I think like the big, the big theme I see on this talk we have today is like removing ego from the situation and making it more about the client. If you, yeah, yeah. If you can't make people comfortable and establish bond and rapport, that is the first step in any single sales process, yep. but you can't throw money at that problem. You got to earn it. You got to do the training. You got to fail a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but what you can throw money at is get the leads and, and do some decent amount of marketing, but you can't do it to develop yourself. That's, yes. that's a personal yeah. endeavor. And, and no matter how much money you throw at the leads, if you can't convert the leads, uh, Charles, I mean, you see this a ton of, yeah, this guy spends hundreds of thousands of dollars a month on marketing. If he wasn't able to convert on those leads, you're just, you're, you're throwing that money. To the the leads are weak. The oh. leads are weak. You're weak. Yes. Okay. <laughs> that's Alec Baldwin. Glenn Gary, yes. Glenn Ross. Look it up. Yeah. All right, He's well, like, Google it. <laughs> the leads are weak. We, we, we have topic four was, was going to be about the market, but we're running a little bit long on time. So I would rather instead ask you guys all your opinion right now. We're not even going to go into topic four. We're going to skip it completely because I'm the, I'm the host. I'm the moderator. Captain. Captain. See right here. I'm, um, but I want to I hear your guys' take on Andrew right now. Speaking of objections and salespeople. Pitch me why right now would be a good time to buy. Because statistically, in, in our hyper local market, right now is actually the worst time to be a buyer and it's the best time to be a seller. There's just no inventory. They are suggesting that rates are going to come down. So in theory, quarter four in our market would be the best time to buy and probably the worst time to be a seller. What's happening in your market and what would be your advice right now for a buyer? So this is a frequently asked question out there and, and like, you know, Quora and see what people are, is now a good time to buy, is now a good time to sell. The thing is we are not in a vacuum and every single individual situation is so different, which is why I don't like to play the game of this is this big swath. I'm going to put all you guys in this bucket and this is the solution for you. Going back to what we were talking about earlier, you know, you first need, you have to seek 
to understand before you can be understood. So before I can even give somebody this type of advice, I really got to know what their situation is. Now, and you only can claim victory on these types of debates in the past because we don't know when the best time to buy is and we don't know when the best time to sell is. And you know, I'm convinced agents don't even know properly how to price homes. <laughs> because if you took a room full of agents, good agents at elite retreat, and you say, hey, whole, whole room, how, how many of you were really surprised at how high a home sold recently? Oh, every hand go, oh yeah, I couldn't believe that one. <laughs> yeah, it's because you don't know the price. <laughs> you don't know the price. The appraisers don't know the price. All you can control is the process because a good process will drive good results. If you have a good process long-term, you'll consistently get good outcomes. The problem is sometimes your bad process will give you a good outcome and yeah. you do the wrong shit and it still works. That doesn't last long-term, but a good process will always drive good results. So I'm not sure if that's answering your question, but it's, t it's tough to answer because I don't want to go through this diatribe of asking you a hundred questions and then we can yeah. really pull apart what your long-term goals are and that sort of thing. Yeah. And it goes back to motivation, right? So it's right. how long do you see yourself living here for, right? Going over the pros and cons of buying now versus waiting. We're still seeing lines, right? Uh, right now I, I'm losing offers with $60,000 over asking oh, yeah. um, price. Like, if you look at all these predictions, everybody was wrong. Like I, I don't think there's been one correct prediction ever. It's just, everybody's just taking guesses. Teo, what are you seeing right now in your market? And are, are you giving the same advice? It's just per case motivation, yeah. right? Well, it depends on the micro market that you're looking at, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you were to say Los Angeles County as a whole, I mean, that's like looking at multiple states on the East Coast. You know what I mean? LA yeah. is massive and there's so many uh, people. Um, and so if you were to look at, say, downtown LA, it's like a ghost town. It's really hard to sell in downtown LA. Um, but downtown if, LA is scary. It's scary. But if you look at areas <laughs> by the beach in smaller communities or even where there's you know, people really want a lot of outdoor space. Um, I'm seeing now in the private remarks on listings offers due on Monday. Um, and I haven't seen that in a while. Right. So I think when it comes to being a buyer right now in L.A., it's if you can afford and if you can qualify for a loan, it's always a good idea to buy real estate in an area where we've seen steady appreciation. If you're looking at the at historically, right? If you're going to mm -hmm. look at just the last three years, I mean, look, we needed this adjustment. The market that we had before was not sustainable. And for any buyers who are sitting on the fence, if those interest rates go down, well, now you're going to be looking at more competition because everybody is a sheep and they're going to be like, oh, I guess now it's a good time to buy. I'm just going to, you know, hop in Bang. the market and care. Yeah. It's like Bang. the people who are bold and who are like, you know what? I can qualify right now. I'm not overextending myself. I know mm. I want to be in this part of LA for the next seven years or five years, whatever it is. Well then yep. go for it. You actually have leverage right now and you might be able to negotiate some concessions or even a, a reduction. Yeah. Charles, what do you, Charles made me put in the broker remarks of our listing that he's not even negotiating. Like, don't even, don't even put in an offer. Just highest and best from the jump. Wow. We already have over. Yeah, we already have over asking. What an like animal. he already made me put in the re remarks. Like, don't. He's not even. He's not going back to people and and negotiating. So Charles, is, you do. We've said it multiple times. You have a ton of uh, listings on the market. Are you seeing any effect uh, with rates and and your homes that you're selling or? Are you just telling everybody highest and best right from the start and everybody's just giving you a hundred grand over asking, nothing's changed? Yeah, basically, obviously, as, as everybody mentioned, it, it's hyper local, depends on your market. So what I've noticed here is if you're above a million bucks, the market's done, dead, non-existent, dormant, asleep. From 700 to a million, there's a certain type of buyer, need a certain type of house, but those are moving if you have the five bedroom houses, got a lot of people with big families moving out from the boroughs, don't want to be in Brooklyn and Queens anymore. Anything under $700,000 is an absolute melee, lines down the block, no inventory, less than three months, and it's just crazy. And the wow. right product priced properly is just flying off the shelves. And that's what I see every week. This week, I'm bringing six houses to market and the showing times and everything is just blowing up. It's crazy. Like I've actually turned myself into what I call the pump and dump king, where usually I gut renovate everything new. Now, a lot of times I'm buying houses, doing very minimal to no work in certain cases, putting them back on the market because I can't afford to renovate them because the cost of construction is so absolutely insane. And the towns yeah. take so long to get permits. But these things are flying off the shelves in the worst condition that need everything, $100,000, $200,000, $300,000 wow. worth of work. Yeah. Yep.
Pump hey. and dump king. Pump and dump yeah. king. Lip a stick on a pig. Danny, uh, melee is a good word. You should write that down. That's like when it's like a scrum. Okay? So a lot of people are, are, are fighting over the same thing. I know this guy, I'm just speaking pig Latin half the episode. All right. <laughs> I'm day up there. This guy's reading from the Bible over here. I don't know where the hell you're getting these words from. I complimented you on your hair 100,000 times. Oh, my times. God. Thank you guys so much for being here. Taya, you are the best. Thanks. Charles, I love you. Uh, I appreciate you being here. Andrew, I love you. Thank you for being here. Hopefully we did good. I mean, I guess we'll find out from Haley. I just, I, I've been unconscious for the last 48 minutes. Uh, thank you for tuning in. We have one more week to go before Eric gets back. I hope he's enjoying his honeymoon. I hope he's enjoying Bangkok. I hope he gets a new six iron because I watched him snap it over <laughs> his neck mid round on his wedding day. Yeah, oh my God. Bad. Yeah, literally snapped it over his neck. Actually pretty impressive uh, to be honest. I didn't think he was that athletic. Uh, but anyway, thank you guys for coming. I think that's the show. Andrew, do you have any other uh, microcosms here to, to drop on us. Any other uh, chemistry words? Any final thoughts? You know, no. But I just the, the takeaway here is you get paid in direct proportion to the information you gather, not the information you give. To tack tack on to what these guys just said, if you're gonna be a good salesperson, you got to gather that intel and then use it for your client's benefit. And gather, be, don't give. And be an outdoor cat. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's it. That that's a wrap. Thank you so much. <laughs>